One. Hi, I'm Cheryl Salem, and I just want to spend a little time with you. I hope it's okay. I'm asking if you run and get your Bible, because I'm going to show you some scriptures. I think some things you're going to really like. I'm going to talk to you about women and prayer, but I'm also going to share with you a little bit about um, what I feel God's called me to do in these last days. Why do I feel like this is so important? Well, almost 40 years ago, I was Miss America. And 40 years later, the feeling, the calling, the fire inside of me to stand for America is very important. And I believe that we've had a lot of fathers. We talk about the fathers of our nation. But where are the mothers? Where are the mothers of the nation? Well, the truth is, it's you and me. It's you and it's me. And no matter what generation you are, you're older than somebody. If you're 15, you're older than a 10-year-old. If you're 20, you're older than the 15-year-old. If you're 30, you're older than somebody. And you know what does that mean to girls? That means there's always somebody we can mother, somebody that we can help, somebody we can mentor, somebody we can bring up to the next place, somebody we can share with what we believe we've learned. Well, God's shown me a lot in my years, and I want to share it with you. I just want to help you be the best woman you could possibly be. I want to help you love yourself and love your identity. And I just want to share some things with you that's in my heart. If you've not been following us here on our YouTube channel, Salem Family Ministries, I'm asking if you just look right there on your screen, you see where it says subscribe? I want you to click that button and give us your email. And what will that do for you? That means that every time that we post a new video, which we're trying to post often now, you'll get an email from us saying we've posted and you don't have to come to our channel and search and look for the new videos. You'll get an email. They'll take you right to the new video. And right while you're there, you see that little bell? If you hit that bell, it's your notification bell. It'll let you be notified even quicker. So that's helpful too. If you like what you're hearing, if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. Let us know you like it. If you have a bad comment, keep it to yourself. Ha ha ha. Don't really care. No, I do care. <laughs> but please be kind. I do want to meet your needs. And my real question today is, what can I do for you? Uh, what can I tell you? What can I say that's going to help you? My heart is to just help you. Help you be a better woman. Help you be a better mom. Help you be a better wife. Uh, I titled this I got this all ready to preach, and I didn't get past the first paragraph, so I wanted to share it with you. I call this Ask a Woman because when Jesus was on the earth and he wanted to get his ministry in the place he had to have it, if you read the scripture carefully in Luke, it talks about that Jesus was going all around, I think it's chapter 8, and then it says these 12 disciples were with him. But then it says, and, and it starts naming these women. And it calls them by name. It talks about Mary Magdalene, who uh, Jesus cast out seven devils. And it goes on and talks about the wife of Chusa. And he talks all about these different women. So here's what I want you to know. Everywhere Jesus went, he took a team. And his team was made up of mostly women. So when I ask you to join me on womenofthenation.org, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to raise up a team of women. You may never be face-to-face -face with me, but right now, you know what we're doing? We're face-to-face. -face. I'm talking to you, and you're looking right in my face, and you can comment right there below and ask me questions, and on other videos, I'll be able to answer those for you. So I would like to hear from you, and I'd like to know what else you would like to hear. So ask a woman. If you want to get a job done, ask a woman. And don't look for a woman that's got plenty of time because that girl can't get a thing done. But if you find a woman that's so busy, she's got a thousand plates split, spinning, ask her to get it done and she'll get it done. You know why? She already knows how to organize. She already knows how to use her time wisely. She can get it done for you. So I'm asking you now, which one are you? Are you the woman that can't ever seem to get anything done and you have plenty of time on your hands. Are you the woman that's so busy? Yeah, I bet you're relating already to the busy one because most of us are. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. You're an amazing girl. You're an amazing woman. And God's going to do great things with you because you've already proven that you can accomplish a lot. So what am I doing? I'm asking you to join me to pray. Pray for your family. 
Pray for your community. Pray for your local church. Pray for America. That's what we are assigned to do as women, to stand in the gap for our husbands and for our children and for our marriages, for our homes and for our nation. Let's start with America because if we can save the nation, we can save the home. We can save the marriage and we can save the children and give them a future. So I want to show you some scripture. First of all, there's a little something I want to share with you right on the top. This is what God said to me. There's a shift in the kingdom of heaven over the past year. Shift. What happens when there's a shift? When you're driving a stick shift, when you shift, you go to a higher gear. When there's a shift in the realm of the kingdom of heaven, we're moving to a higher level. And you can stay on the lower one if you want and go slower. Or you can shift up to the next level because that shift is already taking place. And if you will shift with me, you're going to go to a higher level, higher level of living, higher level of being. And one of those things is understanding righteousness. What is righteousness? Right standing with God. That's what righteousness is, right standing with God. So what does that mean? And why, why are you talking to me about righteousness? Because if every woman that I'm talking to right now, and you guys too included if you're watching, the moment you said yes to Jesus and you were born again and you got saved, at that moment, a divine shift happened. What happened? When you say, yes, Jesus, you are my Lord, you're my Savior, forgive me of my sins, forgive me and give me a future and a hope, and, and I'm giving you my life, I'm giving you my future. The moment you do that, you literally take on the nature of Jesus, and He takes on the nature of you. See, when He went to the cross, and He went to hell for you, that means you never, ever have to go to hell if you just receive what he did for you, you don't have to pay the price. He paid it for you. And a divine shift happens at that moment. He takes on all your sin. He already did it for you. He doesn't have to do it again. And here's what happens when you say yes to Jesus. You take on all his righteousness. You know why? It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough things to earn righteousness. You can't lose it. No matter what you do, you can't lose the righteousness of God unless you denounce Christ. So here's what I want you to get. I believe I'm going to live very long. I'm 61 now. I think I'm going to live at least to 100 because I've got a lot to get done. And so let's just say I'm living to 100 years old. Do you realize from the day I was born again at 14 years old and God clothed me with the righteousness of Jesus, from that day until I die, whatever year that is, I will never be a moment more righteous than I was the day I got saved. Because the day I got saved, I took on all of the righteousness of Jesus. And he took on all of my old sin nature so that I don't have to wear that anymore. Why am I talking to you about this? Because women are always thinking that they have to do something. They have to earn their way. That they're not good enough. That they that they need a, a different identity. If I could just get past my hurt. Listen, we all have pain. I buried my daughter. That pain of grief when she went to heaven at six years old. Gabrielle went to heaven at six. I was 42-year-old mom. I took on that grief. And within three months, I had colon cancer. Because I let grief become my identity instead of wearing the righteous identity that I already had. Wearing the righteousness of God doesn't mean, girls, that you're not going to have issues. You're going to have issues, but your righteousness doesn't change. When you walk in the righteousness of God, that never changes. You have all of the righteousness of Jesus in your life. You're wearing it. That's why he calls it a robe of righteousness. You put it on and you wear it. And you never have to take it off. So here, why am I sharing this with you? Because I'm asking you to join me in a war. A war that we've already won. We just have to prove that we've won it. Now, why am I asking you to do that? Because you need to learn how to fight. You have got to stop letting all the things that's happened to you become your identity. I am not the sum of all my broken places. I am not crippled from a car wreck, abused for 10 years. I am not the, the one who lost her daughter. I am not the one who's 
overcome cancer, or fibromyalgia, or connective tissue disease, or chronic fatigue, or crippling arthritis. Yes, all those things have been healed in my life, but none of those things are my identity. My identity is wearing the righteousness of God. That's who I am, and that's who you are. You just have to need, you just have to own it and know it in your spirit. So, Let's look at 2 Timothy 3. I'm putting my glasses on so I can see. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. If you have your Bibles, I want you to find it. And I want you to learn how to study your Bible. How do we do that? Well, first of all, get one. Second of all, get it off the shelf. Third of all, don't be afraid of writing in it and marking it up. My Bibles, if they're not written all over, then I don't think I'm studying much. I write all over my Bibles. I, this is a brand new one, and I've got it all marked up. I write all the revelations God gives me. And when you get into 2 Timothy, I want you to find it. And then I want you to notice that the first, is chapter 3, the first verse in chapter 3, 2 Timothy, starts out talking about right now. It starts out because it says, but understand this, in the last days, that's the days we're in right now. You didn't know that? Well, it is. We are in the last days right now. Now, it could be, weeks before Jesus come, months, years. But we're in the last days because when you study out all the prophetic scriptures, all of them have been fulfilled. All of the scriptures have been fulfilled that prophesy the last days. And all the prophets agree on this right now. So we are in the last days. You should live your life as if we're in the last days. Now let me show you what the scripture says about the last days and you're gonna know we're in the last days. In the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come. Difficult days that will be hard to bear. You may be saying, wow, that's already my days. Listen to this verse, verse 2. For people will be lovers of self, narcissistic, self-focused, lovers of money, impelled by greed, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. Yeah, that's the world we're living in. And they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, calloused and inhumane. Absolute describing what's been going on across the world and in America. Some of the things that's happened, the school shootings and the, the shooting in San Bernardino and many other tragic things. Inhumane. Inhumane. Devoid of natural human affection. People couldn't do that unless they were devoid of human affection. Just the heart of humanity can't stand to see people suffer. But it says in these last days, that's the way people will be. Irreconcilable, malicious gossips, devoid of self-control, intemperate, immoral, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of outward godliness. Wow, wait a minute. You're saying that everything I just named are people that hold to a form of outward godliness? Mm -hmm. You see, I wasn't reading things that describe the world. I was actually reading things that the Bible says describes the heart of people that go to church, that call themselves religious. Although they've denied its power for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. So these are people that say, I have faith in God. But their conduct, the way they act, the way they talk, the words coming out of their mouth, it's nullifying anything that they say, oh, I love God. Well, your conduct proves differently. Oh, I love God. Well, the way you treat your neighbor shows me you don't really love God. Oh, I love God. And then you gossip and talk evil about your girlfriends and you talk awful about your neighbors and even your own husband. You know what? I'm going to be real careful here, girls. But the truth is this. The Bible says in James that love covers a multitude of sins. I don't care how awful your husband is. If you love him, you don't expose him. You cover him. You don't go around telling everybody what a dog he is. You cover for him. And I'm not saying in a bad way like if he's hurting you or abusing you or hurting your kids. I'm not saying cover for that. I'm saying just the stuff like you don't like the fact that he uh, doesn't close the cabinet doors or he doesn't take the trash out and you yakety yakety yak about that. I, 
I'm just talking girl to girl to you right now. If you want to walk in the love of God, and if you want the love of God shed abroad to you, then you need to plant that because judge not lest you be judged every time you judge your husband. Or, guys, if you're watching, if you uncover your wife and expose her and say, my wife does this and my wife does that, that is not love. Love covers. It doesn't expose. And here's what God does for you. He covers you when he could have exposed you. He covered me when he could have exposed me so many times, but he loves me. So he gives me opportunities to repent and he covers me until I work it out. And I'm just asking you to look at your own life and your own behavior to, to the light of the word and see if you are measuring up to what the word says. Avoid, now here's what it says about these kind of people that I just talked about. It says avoid such people and keep far away from them. Why? Because people's behavior is contagious. If you want to walk a righteous walk, if you want to walk a, a holy life, you got to hang with holy people. Because their walk affects your walk. Their mouth affects your mouth. Their lifestyle affects your lifestyle. What they choose affects what you choose. That's why the Bible says avoid them. Because he's trying to save your life. Trying to protect you from people that maybe you don't know how to know, you don't know how to protect yourself from. So now, now we've read about seven, six or seven verses. For among them are those who worm their way into homes and captivate morally weak and spiritually dwarf women. Now wait a minute. There's not one word about women until you get down to verse six. And when you get down to verse six, he points out women. Morally weak and spiritually dwarf women, weighed down by the burden of their sins, easily swayed by various impulses, verse 7, always learning and listening to anybody who will teach them, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We're not talking about stupid girls here. We're talking about well-educated people that always are learning, but never seem to come to the truth. You see, the Bible... It's not just knowledge. Oh, it's a tremendous amount of knowledge. But it's not just knowledge. It's truth. You can look, you can ask your phone anything. It knows everything. It is the great tree of knowledge. You can ask it anything. And just like the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, it says the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That cell phone of yours, it can answer every good question you ask it. It can also answer any evil question you ask it because it's devoid of conscience. It can take you to any evil site you want to go to, or it can take you to listen to any great preacher you want to. It's the great tree of knowledge, good and evil. In fact, I love to point out that right on that little cell phone, if you start it up, and it's on the back of some of them, and it's definitely on the front when you open it up, it comes up, it's an apple with a bite out of it. Not just an apple, but with a bite out of it. Why? The tree of knowledge. They knew when they created it. It was the tree of knowledge. But God is more than knowledge. He will take you from knowledge all the way into truth. And that's what you're looking for. You want truth. This whole generation, they're looking for truth. They've got all the knowledge in the world, access to anything, access to everything. But their heart still cries out for truth. I want to know what's real what's true. And God is true. I was, my husband and I were talking today, Harry and I were talking today. And the truth is that no matter how we act, we're never separated from the love of God. He always loves us. He never runs away from us. Even when we're acting like jerks, he stays right there with us. The Bible says that neither life nor death, nor any creature, nor anything ever created, ever can separate you from the love of God. The love of God runs after you like a force you can't imagine. God loves you. He absolutely adores you. Just like if you're a mom or you're a dad, how you adore your kids. He adores you even so much more than that. So why does he put this in the scripture about morally weak and spiritually dwarfed women weighed down by their burden of sins Easily swayed by various impulses, always learning and listening to anybody who will teach them, but never coming to the truth. This is, 
This is the woman that won't get over her past. This is the woman that, what does it say? Weighed down by the burden of their sins. You've been forgiven of your sins, and yet you're still beating yourself up. You've been forgiven of your past. You've been set free from anything past this moment. Gone under the blood of Jesus. Gone forever. You bring it up to him day after day. You bring it. He's like, I can't remember it. I threw it into the sea of forgetfulness. That's the last chapter of Micah. I love that. I like to add to that. God takes your sins, your weaknesses, your failures, all your stuff. He rolls it up in a ball. He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness and he posts a no fishing sign. He doesn't want you going back there fishing in your past. He's saying, Isaiah 43, 18 says, remember not the former things. Don't even look back at it. Remember, I'm doing a new thing. God doesn't fix your past. He cuts you loose from it. Just separates you and says, let's move on, baby. Let's go on. I've got something great in front of you. I've got great plans for you. I've got a great future for you. Let's move. Let's go from here. Let's go into the future. So, women, if you hear this and you think, man, that's me. I'm spiritually dwarfed. I'm, I'm morally weak. You don't have to stay that way. Right now, ask Jesus. Right now, say, Jesus, come into my heart. He will come in right this second. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Forgive me for all my stupid stuff. Forgive me for all my sins. Forgive me for listening to stupid people. He will right this second. Jesus will come into your heart and you will be a new person. Your old person passes away like it never existed. You get a new start right this moment with Jesus Christ. He wants you. Don't you want him? He's the truth you've been looking for. He's the peace you've been longing for. He's the one. He's the one who helps you grow up. You don't have to stay spiritually dwarfed or morally weak. You can grow up in Christ and he'll be with you. Never leave you. Never forsake you. So let's move from here. I'm going to read to you what I wrote. We must release a righteous revolution revival in our land. But we can't release a revival in the nation or in my state or my community or my church until I learn how to have my own personal revival. Why do I talk about righteous revolution? Because I've had one. I have a righteous revolution going on inside of me personally every day. I am being revived. That's what revival means. I'm being revived. I'm not dying I said this today, my clock is going backwards, not forward. My youth is being renewed like the eagles. I'm not getting older. I'm not clock ticking down my clock to death. I'm, I'm reversed. I'm reversing the curse. I'm getting younger every day. I'm going to leave the earth when it's time for me to leave the earth. And I'm going to leave the earth not sick, not, not dealing with sickness and disease. I'm going to live and I'm not going to die until Jesus tells me, come home, and I'm going to be glad to get out of here, but I'm not getting out of here until he says so. And I'm going to live. I'm going to live. The Bible says that I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord in my life. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm telling you, he's healed me of cancer. He's healed me of crippling arthritis. I'm telling you, he's healed me of fibromyalgia. Why am I telling you this? Because you need to know it. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. You need your own revival. Just personal revival right there. It's not about your marriage changing. It's about you changing. It's not about your family changing. It's about you changing. We look out here and we say, if, if all this could be better, I would be better. Mm -mm. Right here. If this is better, everything's better. And when this is better, somehow, miraculously, all of this other gets better. Because when you're better, you do life better. I'll just give you a little nugget. When our daughter went to heaven, I had no idea how I was going to keep moving. It was hard. I didn't want to get up every day. I just wanted to pull the covers over my head. I wanted to die. I wanted to just slip down in the bathtub and stop breathing. It wasn't that I had a spirit of suicide on me. I just didn't want to be here. And I realized one day, I'm here. I need to live. Stop looking for death and look for life. And I started choosing every day, I'm going to live and not die. I'm going to live and not die. 
I'm going to live and not die. And, and I began to realize things like the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's a scripture that's in the Bible. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's in the book of Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. If you've lost your joy, you feel weak. I just read you about morally weak women. If you're sad, if you're depressed, you're fighting. You need joy. And how do I have joy? Well, it's not fairy dust. I wish it was. If it was, I'd go poo on you. And you could have it right there. But it's not. Joy is a choice. And joy is an activation of your faith. There are days I'll get in front of the mirror and I'll say, ha, 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 ha. And it doesn't sound like laughing. But my body doesn't know. They've actually proven scientifically that your body doesn't know the difference when you go, ha, 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 ha. And when I'm really laughing. My body has no clue. It thinks I'm laughing. So my cells start getting healthier because I'm laughing. Wow, science has proven that. Is that crazy? So you don't feel like laughing? You have nothing to laugh about? Then make yourself just ha, 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 ha. My body doesn't know the difference. All of a sudden, my cells start getting healthier, start being active. Why? Because the Bible knew, Jesus knew, God knew when he made us that the joy in our cells would make our cells happier and healthier. Do you know doctors have started putting funny TV shows on in, in the hospitals where people are dying because it extends their life when they laugh? Wow, God wants you to be happy. He wants you to be joyous. So what would I do? I would get up. Did I want to laugh? No. Did I want to cry? Yes. Did I want to die? Yes. I didn't want to live. I wanted to die. But I needed to live. So to live, I needed to learn to laugh. So I'd just start thinking of things that would make me laugh. Funny things. And I would rehearse them and I would write them down. And I would just stand in front of the mirror and laugh. Now you're probably thinking, this is silly. Here's the truth. Scientifically, it works. Not just the truth. You're looking for truth. This is truth. Google it for heaven's sakes. You're going to find medical papers on laughter doing good like a medicine. Why am I telling you this, ladies? Because I want you to have your personal revival. God gave me a vision in January a couple of years ago, 2017. And in that vision, I saw a tidal wave of God's revival hitting America. You want a tidal wave? I do. I want a tidal wave of His glory in my life. I want a tidal wave of His presence. It's time to get healed. It's time to be free. It's time to stop being moved by our feelings, but being moved by who you know you are. You are the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. Say it. I am the righteousness of God. You are. So, God talked to me about my prayer life. A few years ago, He got on to me. He said, you're praying wrong. I said, I'm praying wrong. He said, yes. He said, you've known better, but you've slipped into a bad habit. I said, really? What am I doing wrong? He said, you're asking me to do things. I said, wait a minute. I thought I was supposed to ask you to do things. He said, no, you know better than that. You ask me to do things, and when I don't do them, you ask Jesus to do things. And when he doesn't do them, you ask the Holy Spirit to do things. And the truth is, Jesus told you he was going to send you the Holy Spirit, and he's leaving you in charge. So what are you doing with it? Choose you this day whom you will serve. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What, what am I saying? I'm saying we have more power than we want to admit. Jesus was saying to me, the Holy Spirit was saying to me, God was saying to me that, that they've done what they're going to do. God sent Jesus Jesus went to the cross and died for us, rose from the dead so that we can live forever, sent us the Holy Spirit to be our helper, but He's not going to do it for us. He helps us. So we have to get proactive. We have to get up and put a smile on our face. We have to get up and, and start praying. And maybe you need to get in shape. So you need to start walking and praying, walking and talking to God. These are things you can do. They're simple, but you got to start, and you got to start somewhere. So start today. So these are just little things you can do. In Genesis 3, I want to share this one with you. As you can see, I have lots and lots of pages, but I'm not going to go into all of it because I don't want you to click off. 
I want you to look at this last one, Genesis 3. Don't just uh, look at your Bible on your phone either. Make sure you get your Bible and start writing. You should just see. Now see, this is a brand new Bible. I don't know if you can see, but I've got all these underlines. I got all these extra words out because when I study it out, I find things. I run references. Uh, there's things at the bottom I, I really want to focus on. It's too little to read, so I'll write it big at the top. Um, for instance, in Genesis 3, I have this underlined. Verse 14. Now, what's happened up until the until this point in the story is um, Adam and Eve been in the garden, full dominion over the earth. They're not just dominion over the garden. They're dominion over the earth. In fact, they're given the Garden of Eden like the starting ground, and they're supposed to tend the ground and bless it and work it until the whole earth is covered in the Garden of Eden. That was their job. That was all they had to do was watch the Garden of Eden take over the whole earth. Can you imagine the entire earth like the Garden of Eden? And so Satan, who had already fallen, and he was cast to the earth, and he was thrown, and one-third of the demons fell with him. It says um, that his tail grabbed a third of the stars. Well, that's talking about a third of the demons fell with him, and they fell to the earth. Now, he's in the garden, and he's in the tree of good and evil. He's in that tree. He's in the tree of knowledge. That's why you have to be careful what you allow in your eye gate when you're looking at your phone, that things don't pop up in front of you that you don't need to see, that you don't need to allow in your eye gate. So we get in here and he convinces Eve to sin, that she should eat of the tree that God said, if you eat of that tree, God never told her she couldn't eat of it. In fact, he said she could. He said, you can eat of every tree in this garden, but if you eat of that one, you will die and you will die in your sin, and your spirit man dies. So he, he wasn't saying, no, don't eat of that tree. He was saying, if you do, it's going to be bad for you. Don't do it. So you see what I'm saying? It's like when you tell your child, don't step out in the street, or don't touch that, that thing. It's hot right there. Don't touch it. And then they do it, and they pay the consequences. He told her not to do it. There would be consequences. She would, who knows how long. Adam and Eve stayed in the Garden of Eden. It could have been thousands of years before she finally succumbed to Satan tempting her. He tempted her, and I could spend a year talking to you about that, the whole tree of knowledge and what it must have sounded like because Satan was filled with pipes and timbrels, and on the day he was created, he had all these instruments inside of him, and now he fell to the earth, and who knows what kind of beautiful sounds are coming out of that tree, and she's being lured and trapped and eventually she succumbs she eats up the tree of good and evil her natural eyes are opened now she realizes they've been covered with the glory of god they've had no other covering but the glory of god they didn't need any other covering except the glory of god now she eats and realizes oh no i'm naked i don't have the covering of the glory of god she talks adam into eating he knew not to do it. He willfully chose to follow her. And that's why I talk to women when we do our Women of the Nation conferences, our summits. I talk to women about influence. Women have been given this massive God gift of influence. What are you doing with yours? Because you're using it all the time. If you're using it for good, you're influencing. If you're using it for your own personal gain or for something that shouldn't be done, that's called manipulation. But it's a beautiful gift God gave us called influence. What are you doing with it? So, she used her influence, now turned to manipulation, because she's uncovered. She doesn't have the glory of God covering her now. And she knows she's naked. She wants Adam to be like her and to be sinful. So she gets him to eat. He willfully eats. Now he knows he's naked. He loses the glory of God covering. Wouldn't it be amazing? See, when we're restored back through Jesus Christ, we are once again wearing the robe of righteousness. We're being covered with the glory of God. We're going through life covered in the glory of God. Yes, you are. I don't care what you feel like. You may act like you're ashamed. You may even feel shame. And shame tries to cover you. But God says, no, 
You are covered with the glory of God. You're covered with the rope of righteousness. Get your head up. Act like it. Look like it. Walk like it. Talk like it. Don't let shame be your covering. When Jesus died and rose again, so you could be covered once again with the glory of God. So, that's all that happened in the story. You get to this point. Now, God is just not mad. He's so disappointed. He created mankind to be with him. He created male and female to be with him. Lucifer fell, became Satan. He lost his worship. Mankind, he said, I'll create an entire race of people who will take your place, Satan. They will worship me. They will fellowship with me. They will be in relationship with me. And then they sinned, and that caused separation. God did not separate from us. Mankind separated from God. That's why God wanted to give us a choice to come back. And it took him thousands of years to get it all back into place. They couldn't live by the law. The law and the blood of an animal wasn't good enough. It had to be the blood of the Son of God in a sinless human nature. And Jesus died for us so we can be back in right relationship with our Father God and know our position as sons and daughters, kings and priesthood. So it comes to the point now, Adam has sinned, Eve has sinned, and here you got standing and just kind of imagine it in your mind. You've got God Almighty standing there. He says, where are you? And Adam and Eve say, we've hidden ourselves. Why did you hide yourself? Because we're naked. How do you know you're naked? Well, he knows, of course, that they've sinned. So you get down to verse 13. It says, the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled and deceived me, and I ate from the forbidden tree. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Oh, he didn't start pronouncing any kind of judgment on man or woman. He started with the one who started it all. Because you, Satan, have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity, open hostility, war between you and the woman and between your seed, your offspring, yes, Satan has offspring, the Bible says so right there, between you and your seed, your offspring, and her seed, and in my Bible that's capitalized S because that's talking about Jesus. And he, Jesus, shall fatally bruise your head and you, Satan, shall only bruise his heel. And then it goes on and says, to the woman, God said, I'll greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you'll give birth to children, yet your desire and longing will be for your husband, and he will rule with authority over you, and he will be responsible for you. Now, this came with the fall. We're redeemed from the fall of mankind. Women are redeemed from this curse because of the blood of Jesus. Satan is not redeemed from this curse because he can't be redeemed. So, God puts this curse on Satan. Every day for the rest of your life until I throw you into the lake of fire, women will hate you. Women will wage war on you. Women will have open hostility, enmity with you. Wow. Now you might think, well, that's terrible for women. That's awesome for women. God says, women, sick them to the devil. That's what he said. Get after him. Go after him. Why did he do that? Because women are fighters by nature. That's why we give birth to the kids. If men had to push a baby out, there'd be no more human race. That'd be the end of it. But a woman, she pushes and she pushes until she gets that head out. And then she pushes and she pushes. Why did God say women 
from this day forth, there's going to be war between you and the devil because he knew that women would never give up, never stop, never pound in on the devil. I'm telling you, women, I want you to pound on the devil's head knowing that God gave you the right to do it. And if you want to hate something, hate the devil because God said, I've set open hostility between you. You can be mad as hell at the devil all the days of your life. You can get up every day and the devil will say, oh no, she's up. Up. Oh no, oh no, don't, don't you ever for another moment of your life be afraid of the devil. I'm telling you, he's afraid of you because God put a war between women and the devil and he is afraid of a woman. The Bible says in James 4, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know what resist means? When you're working out, resistance means you're pushing. That's why women push a baby. That's why we push in war. That's why we push in prayer. I, I love to say, pray until something happens. You know what that spells? Push. Pray until something happens. That's what women do. We pray until something happens. We push. And I'm telling you, when the, you get up and you got this higher voice a woman has, the devil hates that sound of that voice. He hates it. God didn't put open hostility between men and the devil. He put open hostility between women and the devil. And this is not our curse. This is our blessing that we can fight and war against the devil all the days of our lives. And, and, and he went on to say, and here's the thing. The devil's going to have offspring because the Bible says he will. And God says, and I'm going to put open hostility between women's children, offspring, and he also, he does the S, the seed of a woman is Jesus. I'm going to put open hostility between Jesus and the devil too. And this is what he says. Woman's seed, Jesus, woman's seed will fatally wound your head, devil. Fatally. You know what that means? The devil has a limited time. He has a fatal wound coming. And it says you will merely bruise his heel. Merely bruise his heel. So stop looking for the devil as if he's some horrible thing. He is under your feet. You are mighty and powerful and strong. And God gave this to us as a blessing. We are the devil's worst nightmare. We are are his bad dreams. When the devil tries to take a nap and he wakes up startled, it's because a woman's in his face speaking the word of God. A woman's in his face saying, you'll get away from my family. You'll get away from my children. You'll get away from my home. You will not make me sick. No sickness can live on my body because this body is the righteousness of God. I am the redeemed of the Lord and I've been redeemed from the curse. Ladies, Come on, get your fight on. It's time you enjoyed your life. I'm telling you, if you'll get in your right place and take your position as warriors against the devil, you're going to find your happiness again. You're going to find your purpose again. You're going to say, wow, I was created for this. I was created to beat the hell out of the devil. You were created to win against the devil. I'm telling you, God gave you the right. He gave you the position and he made you a girl. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So, I hope you like that as much as I like telling you. It's so much fun to do that. So, women, you're not cursed. These are not your curses. These are the curses of the devil. We're given a judgment to follow later about childbirth, and then we're redeemed from it. Galatians 3.13 says you've been redeemed from the curse. So, we've been redeemed from that curse because of the blood of Jesus. So, yes, we were pronounced a curse on women, and then God redeemed us from it. The devil was cursed with women, and he'll never be redeemed from the curse of open hostility with a woman. So I just remind you of some women here that God reminded me of. Jesus knew what God did. So when Jesus knew that women had open hostile war with the devil, that's why he surrounded himself, I believe, with a team of women. Because he knew these women would fight along with him. They wouldn't run. And we know the women didn't run at the cross. Mary Magdalene was there. Mary, his mother, was there. And John. That's all. Everybody else deserted him. But there was two to one women to men standing right there all the way to the cross. 
after he was crucified, went to the tomb, dead and buried, and was lying in state in the tomb? It was only the women that went and tended to his body. I'm not dissing on the men. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Women have a way. We're not afraid. And we live in a different culture than they live. They were still the ones that showed up for Jesus. We have more freedom now than they ever had. We have freedom in our nation. We have freedom and rights that they had them too. But they had them in Jesus. We have them in Jesus. We don't need a laws to be written to give us freedom we already have. Jesus already gave it to us. But we do have natural laws written for us too that give us even more freedom. And women, don't cow down. Don't back away. Don't, don't hide yourself. Get out of here and be the woman God made you to be. Don't be afraid. So the Bible says in Psalm 68 that the women published the news. The women shared the news. That's why I'm raising up women of the nation. That's why I'm asking you, womenofthenation.org, to go on to my website, womenofthenation.org, and sign up to pray with me. I need you to stand with me. I need you to publish the news. I need you to tell your girlfriends and to tell the people you work with and to tell your sisters to sign up and let's pray together. Do you realize that in a year's time, we have over a thousand women praying every day for our nation? And, and I'm not doing a national television show. I'm not promoting this. God's drawing. God's drawing women to come together to be in unity, to be in, organ we're organized, we're strategizing, and we're going to take this nation for Jesus. We're going to take this nation back for righteousness and take our place as women of the nation. Now, here's what else they did. The women provided for his needs. Did you know that? Matthew 27 and 55 and Luke 8, 2 and 3. It says that women, not here, here in this day, primarily men were the ones who made the money. And yet it says women provided for him. Women paid for things. Women gave the money that supported his ministry. Do you realize statistically right now, in the churches across the world, and specifically in America, 95% of all funds raised, uh, tithes and offerings, are given to the church by women because women are givers. Now, men, you can jump in here anytime and be a giver, but I'm just sharing what the Word says. The women were with him when all others deserted him in Matthew 25. And don't forget it was Mary, a little girl, a teenage girl, that God called to believe so the Holy Spirit could come upon her. It was that little girl, Mary, that carried the Word of God inside of her as a seed so that Jesus could be born to the earth. And then it was her cousin, an old lady in her 80s, Elizabeth. So it doesn't matter how young you are. Here Mary, a little teenage girl, is carrying Jesus, and now Elizabeth's given birth to her first baby in her 80s, and she's carrying the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, the one who will say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The one who will say, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's going to be John. Well, so you see, it doesn't matter how young you are. God's calling you to pray with me. It doesn't matter how old you are. God's calling you to pray with me. You have time left, and you need to be about your father's business. You're just beginning. You need to be about your father's business. Can I get you to join me? Can I get you? I want you to help me. We are going to change this world. I've got so much I want to share with you. So much I want to ask you to be with me on the battlefield, in the courtroom. And I'm going to come back and do another teaching, maybe uh, a week from now. I'll come back and talk to you about the positions God's showing me how to set up our prayer life so we understand what we're actually doing legally. Let's talk about that next time. Uh, it won't be too long. I'll be able to get back with you. And I'm going to try to do this once a week. And it'll be like our little church. We can have our little church time together. And I can share with you and help you be the strong woman God's called you to be. And if, if you get not anything out of our messages, if you're getting anything out of my sermons, if, you, if you're wanting to ask me questions, please do so right there in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe right there on your screen. You can see it with your email. You're subscribed to us. Then I can send you a little notification letting you know that we posted a new video so you don't have to come back and search. But also, if you are enjoying this ministry, if you're getting anything out of it at all and you would like to help us to do this more, 
to be able to help us financially. I'm going to put a little link right there for you so that you can just click right on the link and go to our SalemFamilyMinistries.org website and you can give a donation through PayPal or use your credit card or your debit card and you can do it right there online. Well, I love you. I appreciate you joining me. I appreciate you being a part of my life. I appreciate you partnering with me. You know what happens when we partner? Partnership's a beautiful covenant divine thing. When you give into our ministry, that's actually what happens. We become partners. And uh, I remember that scripture that talks about partnership in the Bible where they brought in such a huge haul of fish. They fished all night and they didn't catch anything. And Jesus said, cast your net over there. And they bring in all this fish and he couldn't bring it in. The boat was sinking. And so they call for their partners to come. Well, what does that mean? That means that what God's doing in my life, he's doing in yours. When he's healing me, he's healing you. When he's giving me favor, he's giving you favor. When he's opening doors for me, he's opening doors for you because we're in partnership. And so I ask you as women, men too, I ask you to partner with me and help me. Just click right there. Whatever the Lord leads you, whatever he tells you to do, uh, you can give a one-time donation or you can even automatically join us for a monthly partnership right on that same link. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You don't forget to give me any comments, any questions you'd like for me to discuss, but I'm definitely going to talk to you about what happens when we pray. What is the same? What's going on when we pray? And how to use the Word of God to pray for your family, your marriage, and your children, and especially for America. God bless you.